And we are live. This is a live discussion for how to do things with memes, a Davidson Now course that's running on edX um, currently, uh, started yesterday and will go until tomorrow. And so this is a live discussion on our day two, which is about critically engaging with memes. Um, I'm Sandy Richard. I'm an instructional designer at Davidson College and one of the team. And so we're going to start off just introducing who we have here on this call, um, this live discussion today. We are still waiting for our special guest, Leonardo uh, Flores. So once he joins, he will introduce himself as well. All right. And uh, I'm Mark Sample. I'm the chair of the digital studies department at Davidson. I study and teach uh, digital culture, which is you know what memes are uh, definitely a part of. Um, I, we're going to go around, and each of us are going to say like one thing that we really, uh, will, you know, why we're so drawn to memes. And for me, I, I think memes are really fascinating because they're this kind of instant, instantaneous crystallization of a whole bunch of ideas in this one little image. You can pack a lot in there, and uh, people almost immediately understand what's going on. There's like this immediate impact. Yet there's so much to talk about underneath the surface, and that's something that I'm really fascinated by. Hi, I'm Ariana. I'm a sociology and digital studies student at Davidson College. I'm a senior, so there's 16 days, I think, till graduation for us, which is a little bit scary, but I'm really happy to be joining us today. Uh, one of the things that really fascinates me about memes, we actually talked about a little bit in the tools of analysis section, but it was this idea about the in-group and out-group function of memes. And Annie Sadler, one of the other members of the course team who isn't joining us today, had brought up the way that memes are really used in group chats. And it, some people use it, I think maybe some younger people use it a lot in the like group me functionality platform where you can actually upload a picture of your friend and meme it yourself. Um, and I'm really interested in the ways that we have these sort of inside jokes by using memes. Hello everyone, my name is Margaret Rella Ford. I'm a junior sociology major and I like memes primarily because they're funny, but because of all the other things, I'm one of the people that Ariana was talking about that uses them in the group chats. My group chats are just riddled with memes because I find them hilarious. Hey, I'm Sarah. I'm also a sociology major and a junior like Margaret. Um, I love memes because I just think there's like kind of what uh Dr. Sample was saying it's like there's so much like underneath it that is like also makes it additionally funny and so it's like not only is it can, could be like a funny picture but like the underlying like context and situation of the original meme but then also like how it applies to the context that you're putting it in, in your own life. So Ricky actually isn't going to join us live here because he doesn't have a microphone and camera. So he'll join us on the other end. Technology, technology oh. spoils it. Um, and Leo's not here yet. Uh, so he'll just kind of chime in when he gets here. Is that okay? So um, maybe I'll start at the, the discussion here. So yesterday on the kind of edX portion of this course, we had this little activity where we asked people to introduce themselves via a meme, like what's their favorite meme, why do they like the meme, and so on. And I think we'll just begin by looking at a few of those memes, and then maybe people uh, you know, watching the YouTube live uh, can chime in on a chat uh, about memes that they'd like to discuss about with some of these critical lenses that we want to offer. But I think we'll start off with this meme, Sarah, that you chose, which is, this is fine. So do you want to say a little bit about that meme? I mean, I imagine everyone has seen it, but we're going to throw it up on the screen anyway. And then uh, you know, describe what you like and, and so on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just a dog. Like, usually I think when it's presented, it's just like a dog in this burning house. And he has this cute little tiny top hat on. And he's just like, this is fine. Like I'm in a burning house, but it's fine. Like I'm okay with what's happening around me. Um, and I think <clears throat> it, why I really like it is that like, especially here at Davidson, like everyone's just like very stressed and it, um, like it can seem so serious, but then like sharing this is just kind of like a collective, like we're all struggling, but like we can also like find kind of like humor in it and just like live in the moment, you know? Um, 
And that's, I don't know, I just really love it because it's like laughing at our own kind of like ridiculous like situations that we've put ourselves in. Um, and plus like just animals, animals and tiny hats. I mean, who doesn't like that? So <laughs> yeah. Great, like uh, Margaret or Ariana, did you have any thoughts about this meme too? That you want to share? <laughs> Um, I really like this meme, particularly because it, like Sarah said, it applies to a lot of things. Like you have a whole lot of deadlines coming up, but you, you're still having fun with your friends or whatever. So everything's not completely like horrible. So it's fine, even though things aren't necessarily going the best, which is why I like it. Yeah, really similarly, like not much to add here, but I definitely do think it's like a, one of the types of memes that's sort of a coping mechanism, right? Like it's actually expressing this idea that we're grieving collectively by just sort of acknowledging that things are, you know, like not actually acknowledging that things are terrible, but like everybody that's having the conversation, if I send this to somebody else, they also know that everything is not fine, but we're just gonna try and move through it anyways, right? Um, so I really like that idea of it being this like sort of conversation around mental health without using like big psych terms. Yeah, I started seeing this meme, as I'm sure most people did, right around the 2016 presidential election, uh, when a lot of the rise of the alt-right and white supremacists and everything, and it, it seemed like so many bad things were happening, and yet so many people were not talking about them or just almost willingly ignoring them. And I think, I mean, that this dog with, with the big white eyes is kind of almost uh, intentionally ignoring this horrible fire that's going around him because he has to in order to survive. Um, something that I, I was thinking about with this meme that I didn't realize until I, uh, I think somebody else on her meme and greet posted a follow-up, that this is fine has become its own caption that people are now using all over the place. Uh, you know, they're attaching it to different media. So I think this is a great example of a, it started off as a comic. I mean, this was a comic that someone then abstracted, excerpted from its original context, posted it online and became a meme. And then there are all these other variations of it, which kind of highlights some of the things that we talked about in the videos from yesterday about memes uh, having this kind of stock template, but people change them and, and, and uh, kind of use them to their own, um, you know, whatever their message is. Uh, so Leo's on the line now as well. So maybe Leo will let you introduce yourself and then you know talk about some of the things that you're interested with memes. You can you can think about this is fine meme or some of the other work that you've done. Well, hi everyone. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this. I wanted to comment on that that last this is fine meme that the artist the the comic artist did a follow up meme in which the the you know the dog suddenly kind of wakes up and starts realizing that this is not okay and needs to take care of uh, some really important things so so but that didn't carry as much right that didn't have the same kind of impact so i think part of what's interesting about memes is that they capture a moment in a conversation in a comic in a in a historical in a media event whatever and then that becomes crystallized as a kind of surface on which we write and comment and riff. And I think when memes become language in a way, I think that's, that's what kind of fascinates me about them. I think uh, whether it's a GIF, which captures usually reactions or some sort of, uh, you know, little kind of moments of almost poetic uh uh body language right um or or just a still image upon which we write i think asking the question of 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 media i think is really important so to segue a little bit about me i'm i'm, I'm fascinated i mean I, i'm a i'm a scholar of electronic literature and but primarily i come at it from a, a media perspective I think memes are really interesting. I mean, my, my formation was with comics uh, originally, uh, later with film. Then I discovered electronic literature and it all kind of clicked. Uh, I was also a, a programming enthusiast, so it really clicked. Uh, but what I like about memes, in, in particular in this moment, it's that it's a step away from the page. 
you know, we the, the, the kind of blank space we have here, of course, this is a whiteboard, but the blank space of the page is supposed to be, it's a sort of symbolic of silence. It's the symbolic of emptiness. And of course, it's not silent and it's not empty. And if you open a Microsoft Word document and you get this virtual page and you start to write in it, you start to realize that there's a lot of culture encoded in that space. Try writing whatever sentence and then just hitting a line break or putting punctuation and then keep typing a lower case. You will get the autocorrect trying to bring you back to writing conventions in which you capitalize initial words on a line of poetry or or after periods, right? You're gonna see how all the rules of the page have been programmed into that space. And and so it really isn't silent. It isn't there's a lot of quiet cultural noise that shapes what happens when we write on the page. So the page, first of all, I want to question it as a neutral writing space. I think it is exerts a kind of cultural hegemonic control over other media. I mean, when we create HTML documents and publish publish them on the web, we call them web pages. You know, we we are we the the page dominates where we're going with so many of these things. So then, when we start writing on images or when we start writing on GIFs, or when we start writing on video, it's a step away from the page. And we're writing on context, on history, on culture, on, on moments, right, that have resonance, that bring certain phrases with them. And I think that is a step towards the poetic, uh, towards compression in language, and and towards like really powerful potential for expression. Now, I wanna share a few of the things. I, I put together just a, a short list of memes and I'll just kind of quickly go over them for comment. And then later on we can, if, if you're interested, we can discuss some of them in, in more detail. Uh, let me see how I can screen share here. Okay, I got it, I think. So now I'm screen sharing. Let me go ahead and open my little list of memes here. Um, you know, I think the first idea is, is in my, uh, you know, I have this little profile picture that somebody, uh, made for me, but this idea of, I'm riffing off of the matrix, of course, the, the, what if I told you meme, um, but I think we're already kind of writing a kind of electronic literature when we are writing memes, because we're writing on something that materially was possible in the world of print but didn't really take off like writing on images we've long been able to do this but it is digital culture that has deployed that were you are you all able to see is the is the screen sharing working does the screen share work yep it's working yeah. yep okay good just just making sure all right so let me show you something else so um a few years ago, I was teaching Hamlet, and I asked my students, I assigned the plays, I assigned some, um, you know, watching different film adaptations, and I gave them the assignment to create memes that were engaging both images from the films they were seeing and text from Hamlet. And they could always put their own twist on it, but those were the constraints they were working with. So. What I'm trying to do is take the meme form and kind of push it a little bit, right? So first of all, I, it was a fascinating activity because the students were able to engage visually with the films. So it made them better visual analytical thinkers of the film, but also made them engage with the text and its compression to be able to fit it into the constraints of a meme form. So, for instance, well, the first reaction my students had was, you know, again, they had to have some text. So this is a, you know, a reaction to seeing uh, the ghost, right? Why that's impossible. And of course, here's the other uh, twist that the students had. 
they never thought it would could be something that could be used for any kind of serious thinking about a text or about a film. And they created other Hamlet memes. Uh, they had fun with it. Um, Hamlet doing the face palm since 1948, right? Really looking at the kind of overdramatic acting style that Laurence Olivier uses in, in that particular, very theatrical, let's say, uh, style there. And we have Hamlet memes like, you know, more recent versions in which we have, uh, again, uh, Hamlet at Blockbuster uh, renting or not renting. So there was a lot of riffing and playing with it. But one thing that I realized was that I had, I had a number of, here, let me go back here. One thing I realized as we were doing these memes is that the students, those memes needed revision. We were sharing them on Twitter, but before we shared them on Twitter, the students, we had to edit because a lot of attitudes and a lot of things the students were not aware of were coming out. So for example, racism, sexism, uh, other things were appearing in the kind of latent, in the, in the content, and they were not even aware of it. Now, just do you have, do you have a good example of a, a meme that your students made that did not? I'm, on, not... I'm live. Just, um, you know, I didn't get an example. And we don't, that. we actually don't want to put your students on the spot or make it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. They were no, and by the time we edited them and shared them, it was, it was already, you know, but I, I think your, uh, larger, your point, I mean, I think it's something that uh, a lot of people could, if they stop to think about it, relate to that. A lot of times we use memes almost uh, without thinking about their context or how they might be like the underlying messages that might be in them or stereotypes or something like that, because there's such a kind of a part of our, the way we communicate online. Now we don't even stop to think about that. Precisely, precisely. And that kind of neutrality of the forum or supposed neutrality or that naivete, right? Because it's so casual, it's fun. We're just doing our thing. No big deal. Uh, reveals a lot about what is, uh, beneath our own threshold of consciousness. So I think it's important then as our educators to kind of go back and, and get our students to reflect upon some of these choices. Now, I myself, I, I will show you one that I, that I myself, upon later discovering notions of digital blackface, made me reflect on my own practice. So for instance, let me screen share again real quick. And I'll show you one that I made and for my digital media criticism class. So, I mean, at first for my digital media criticism class, this was the promo, right? A meme, this is all pretty neutral, uh, uh, cute, right? The, the, the wow dog. All right. And then as I gave the assignments of writing critical memes, means that we're actually giving some serious ideas, so this was one that I created with the, I mean, this was hot at the time, the, the, the famous roll face meme, right? And this is one that I shared quite a bit, thinking about, you know, how ideas get better circulation when they're formatted for the web. And I, I mean, upon reflection, I, I, I hope I didn't fall into that kind of trap of, 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 digital blackface. I think I'm not ridiculing the character, which I think is important. Um, however, you know, it, it, it's really, it made me realize upon thinking about concepts like digital blackface, about my own practice and my own use of memes. My students took this idea and went with different, uh, you know, very kind of student-centered ones, right? This was also a popular one, the Salt Bay uh, meme at the time. And there was, uh, of course, also this one deals with, uh, it's actually a critique of the All Lives Matter discourse, right? So, and, and this student actually made a, a bot that ridiculed and, and critiqued the, the, that kind of attitude, right? Uh, and, and really kind of had this sort of naive 
white male kid uh, saying all sorts of un-PC things and thinking that they're, you know, reasserting whatever it is they think they're reasserting. So, and here's one more that my digital media criticism students created. I, we're not seeing your screen share right now. You're not. Oh, no. Here, let me. I thought I had it on. Let me show you. So maybe, maybe back up to like the All Lives Matter one and then. Here's the All Lives Matter one. Do you see it now? Yeah, we can see it. All right. So, so one of my students created this one. And I mean, it's clear that they're critiquing the attitudes, right? So I think, I think that was a productive way of engaging with some of these ideas. Um, notice also, let me see. This was one, this is the Salt Bay one I was talking about. So again, it's dealing with a, with a more neutral, though still sensitive kind of uh, a situation, right? How, how hard it is to be a graduating student and, and the kind of finances that are that are happening all the sprinkling of problems that that accrue there and there's this one which addresses again the narrative right it's the visual narrative of a moment it's a it's a critiquing trump right my husband is a gentleman and here's millennia left behind in that famous set of images so i think Part of what's interesting in terms of the social function of memes is that they are, how shall I say, they're being used as, I think memes are a way in which the narrative of a moment gets battled out. And I think it is, uh, you get memes from the right, you get memes from the left, you get memes from all kinds of shapes and attitudes, but it's about controlling the narrative of the moment. So for instance, if you see some of the State of the Union uh, memes that emerged when Nancy Pelosi famously clapped at Trump, right? Here's Patton Oswalt uh, labeling it, you know, congrats for inventing the fuck you clap. And there she is clapping at Trump in the State of the Union. And we can see other memes in that vein, right? That make it less political or maybe bring down the political text, right? The, the, the subtext is still there, but now it's being applied to other topics, which is a nice thing about its versatility, let's say. Leo, can I ask, I wanna back up a little bit because I, I think you brought up an interesting um, point when talking about being more critical and thinking through the process of sharing something that when you do it in a class and you have drafts and other people look at it, that idea is not really how it works um, usually on the internet, right? Like we share things very quickly. Oh God. I'm on a group chat. Yeah. Yeah. So like that process of going through with your students, having a time to reflect on it, did that change the way that you then started sharing like just on a daily basis? Um, and did that change the way your students started sharing? Is that something that we should be talking about? Or is that something that like, I would not going to happen for the vast majority of people. So we shouldn't talk about that. I would hope so. I mean, I think bringing teaching memes and teaching meme making and, and really reflecting and looking at graphs before even going public, right and thinking questioning our assumptions leads to not only i think better meme making or more responsible or more savvy or more powerful meme making but also uh you know better practices later on when it comes if they learn what there is to be learned from this right and, and if we all learn what we have to some of the things we should be learning to be more critical and more self-reflective before just hitting share or just uh, or just creating something and sending it without much reflection. So I think that's an important value of bringing means into the classroom as a kind of writing practice and as a kind of critical reading practice and discussion. Yeah, I the um I think a good example of a meme that people just kind of. Ref unreflexive well reflexively unreflectingly shared 
was the distracted boyfriend meme. Um, in fact, that you know, there you could critique that meme for all sorts of things. Which, to put a plug in for the edX side of uh, the course, we actually have uh, four colleagues uh, at Davidson, uh, different professors from various departments, kind of reading that meme and other memes from different points of view. So, if you want to kind of take a peek at uh, you know how you might read some of these memes critically, I think that's a good good way to to look at it. I would. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Ariane. Also dealing with the underlying context of memes, which I think is sort of what we're getting at with this idea of the distracted boyfriend and like what it implies to use that meme. Um, people in the YouTube chat have been talking for a little bit about like the different intentions or the noise of message in certain memes. And I think that that's a really interesting thing. Like specifically Tom Evans had given the example of like using a Kevin Spacey meme and what it would mean to use that now um, versus what it would mean to use that a few years ago. And I think that that's really Part of the same conversation. I'm curious what other people are thinking about that. So we're all afraid to jump in at once, I'm sure, is the problem here. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, it, it again, it points to the, partly how memes are just like a, a snapshot in time and how they, they um, there's some memes that seem to be classics. I was talking with some students earlier today and he he uh, he was I don't know if disappointed was the right word, but he noticed that we seemed to be talking about mostly the classics in terms of memes. Uh, whereas there's on on Reddit there's this whole subreddit devoted to surrealistic memes, and people are making all sorts of memes that never maybe make it into the mainstream. So I think that speaks to how uh, how fast meme culture moves and how something can become relevant or or not so relevant. Um, pretty quickly, and how easy it is to detach them from their cultural context. So I think the Kevin Spacey is a really good example. Um, you know, I, I would feel pretty, hopefully, self-aware that I'm doing that. But I, I don't know, what, what do other folks think about thinking about the memes and, and where the memes come from uh, before you maybe use them? I think there's this weird mix of both trying to be like so universal that you don't need to know who the person is. And then also like having to be totally aware of where this thing came from in case you are actually sharing something that you don't mean to share. And so I think it's like just this, this back and forth thing, right? Like a lot of the memes that were shared yesterday on meme and greet were of actors or older actors. And I was going to mention Leo shared the one of like, Laurence Olivier or whatever, like who knows who that is, right? But that works because mm -hmm. of just the, the visual language of it. Um, so like sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. So how confusing is that? Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think it worked within the community of that class where we were discussing Hamlet. We had seen different film versions of Hamlet. So people recognize the scene and the visual vocabulary of it. So this is a kind of in-group, right? Of course, none of those memes were really likely to go viral or anything like that. You know, they were, they, some would say they're not even memes, they're just image macros, right? And, and, and memes is when you reach a certain virality, so to speak, or uh, spreadability, if you will. Um, however, you know, we make we join conversations. We have our own in conversations, and and I think memes happen in sort sort of regional ways. I had a meme go viral in Puerto Rico, uh, for instance, about some protests that were going on in the first of May two years ago, and I made a meme. Uh, basically, I, I don't have a I don't have it handy to share, but basically there was a very large and peaceful protest at the end of which a small group uh, which may have been even like planted or acting or something started attacking and smashing bank windows and and trying to set things on fire uh, after the protest had ended a really small group and of course the the anti-protest folks were trying to leverage that to try to say uh, this was a violent protest and this was, you know, a failure of civility and so on. And 
so I made a meme, a visual that that really kind of captured uh, a, a defense of what it means to have a successful protest, you know, and and that I don't know, maybe got sixty thousand shares in 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 a twenty four hour period, um, very much in Puerto Rico, but still it moved in Puerto Rico, and it 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 spoke to the moment. And maybe that's that's all we can achieve sometimes, and and that's fine too. So there's memes in the sort of going global memes, and then there's memes that are more regional, or a, a local personality. I think that's probably why people like sharing in these group me. Um, environments because it's a set of that the in groups already there and so it's so much easier to share something that you know that those people will understand and i think those probably exist so much more and people are so scared to actually share something in larger spaces because it you know either they're scared that they're gonna do something wrong or they're scared that nobody's gonna get it or nobody's gonna think it's funny and it's like putting yourself out there so it's it's interesting the different environments that that this sharing happens in. Can, can I ask a question? This would be for, for everybody to think about and people uh, online as well. So um, Leo earlier had mentioned the idea of digital blackface, which is uh, there's a really great article in Teen Vogue by Lauren Michelle Jackson about this concept of basically using a kind of uh, exaggerated expressions on, on black men and, and even more often women to kind of convey some sort of exaggerated performative emotional reaction to something that has happened. And uh, scholars call it digital blackface because it harkens back to earlier traditions um, of literal blackface, of minstrelsy, uh, that's a tough word, uh, and just uh, you know relying on stereotypes and, and everything. So. Um, I often teach this article and we talk, we have these discussions and the question that comes up a lot is, is it ever okay to use digital blackface? What if, what if I'm in a group chat and no one's going to take it the wrong way? No one's going to be offended. Is it, is it ever okay to use um, a stereotype of like an angry black woman in a, in a animated GIF or image macro? Um, to convey, you know, some sort of reaction I'm having to something that's happened in my life. Well, I feel like this also really goes back to like what the author was talking about in that piece and this idea of the emotional outsourcing, right? So I think that there's a difference between using an image that's like not like at any point that you're using an image that's not your body, like returning to the, the dialogue, I guess, that Leo had started with us about this idea of controlling the narrative of the moment. Anytime you're using an image of a body that's not your body, you're controlling the narrative of that body in this meme, right? And I think that that already is like the start of where things start to be kind of shady. And I liked the commentary that people were starting in the meme and greed activity, where we were talking about the difference between controlling the narrative on an animal's body versus on a person's body. Um, but I think that it gets extra complicated and extra prone to be um, really harmful when we talk, when, when we think about these like historical contexts and this idea of how we apply it in an emotional context. So if we're using this to talk about something and to put this persona on somebody else, that's sort of like an extra layer of impact that I think that makes it like much more prone to be a problem than if we were just doing something that, like using an image of somebody that would be doing exactly what we would say anyways, and it's just another person's body doing that, that reaction. Yeah. Any other thoughts about the, you know, is it ever okay or, or to, to use digital blackface? I, I'm probably asking the question the wrong way because the way I'm phrasing it, no one really wants to say yes. Uh, but I mean, are there, are there cases where uh, that kind of representation wouldn't, I don't, I don't know, wouldn't raise as many flags or something. I don't know. So comments on the chat, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Just a quick, um, on the YouTube live, the chat's happening quite actively there as well. And so someone just piped in um, and said like, just best be cautious. 
but difficult when something that goes viral is already that. And so whether you share that or not, right? So mm -hmm. that was, that was a, a complication that somebody brought up there. I mean, this is why I yeah. wished almost exclusively to animals, <laughs> penguins and dogs and cats. <laughs> uh, although, you know, that's not exactly not unproblematic either, but uh, I have definitely become more conscious of of whose body I'm claiming to to kind of uh, use to express my own emotions. Well, something that I think is kind of interesting is when I told my mom about this course happening and I was trying to get her to contribute in the meeting great activity, which I think is coming soon. And so everybody keep checking back. Uh, she asked me if, um, what's that, Bitmoji? She asked me if Bitmoji counted as as a meme. And I told her that she should talk about that in that space because it's kind of interesting, like when we're creating this like digital persona in that app and you're creating your face, like how, does that evade the problems that come from digital blackface? Because like if we're now constructing our own face and body and what we think it to be, to be like reacting of our own emotions, is that different than using, you know, somebody else's body or somebody else's mind? Mm -hmm. And Leo, I thought you, I think you had, were yeah, gonna jump yeah, in too. I, I would add, I, I suspect it's always problematic. I mean, listen, it's transgressive heck from a copyright point of view <laughs> to even meme to do to make memes and to use images without permission. You're already uh, committing some sort of transgression, right? Of course, when it's someone you are politically opposed to and uh, you're kind of ridiculing, um, you know, you catch someone. I don't know someone famous you really dislike picking their nose or or in a particular i mean the media does that with with photography anyways right but but of course we're doing it without any kind of rights or permissions over anything so it's already kind of a transgression now we don't want to go down the slippery slope of transgression and saying it's all fair game uh, i think in the end what we post and what we share and what we create uh, speaks volumes about ourselves and I think we need to be careful if we have a pattern of doing something I think we should reflect upon why that is a pattern uh, you know if we're if we occasionally share a, a, a popular meme that has a person of color or 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 a trans person or gendered person or or whatever then then we need to I mean, I think it's probably okay, but we want to avoid the pattern and maybe reflect upon why we're doing this and, and think about what is our own record uh, of online sharing, creation, and practice. And I think that helps. You know, one of the classic memes I've never felt comfortable creating or, or playing with or sharing is the one of the, the teacher who's kind of Asian and she's talking and, and it's always because I always felt it was saying she was dumb and 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 therefore I never felt comfortable with with that idea uh, condescending Wonka doesn't ridicule Wonka it ridicules the subject matter right so so some things point towards the subject matter of the meme some point away I think that might be one way to helpfully negotiate this I mean, I, yeah, that's a really good point. I, and I just want to, I was talking with a few people about the condescending Wonka and they didn't even realize that that was Willy Wonka, um, Gene Wilder playing Willy Wonka. And it's totally de decontextualized from its source and it still has, it conveys its power. But I like the idea of um, who is the target of the meme? Is, is the target the, the object or person or whoever's in the meme or is it some other exterior source? And I, I actually wondered, this would be a pretty interesting question for folks online and for us here. Like, are there other memes that you just feel uh, a little bit hesitant about using? Were th was there ever a meme that made you stop and like, no, I'm going to swipe past that one and use this other one? This is well, not... You know, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I I recently used uncritically and and as soon as someone pointed it out, I took it down right away. I un used uncritically the one of the of the young man kind of rubbernecking at the other uh, girl while he's walking on the street. I used that one. I 
And the moment somebody pointed it out, I knew it, I was absolutely wrong and just took it down and apologized publicly. Um, you know, these things happen, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes in the, sometimes we don't think things through and, and, and it's okay to recognize when we do that. And I think it's important what we do when we, when we mess up. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my, Yeah, for, for me, one of the ones I'm a little uncomfortable with is the success kid, which is the the baby toddler who has a fistful of sand. Uh, who, it was a you know a real baby photograph that his parents had posted to Flickr, and it just kind of took on a life of its own. And there's a long backstory there and how his parents tried to um, they started suing people who who were using it, and they tried to license the image and everything. It became really complicated. But I feel like every time someone uses that, they're basically exploiting someone's, you know, baby. And uh, it was as someone with kids, hopefully as someone without kids will also feel the same way. Like you probably shouldn't be exploiting, you know, a, a 18 month year old like that. Um, I don't know. Are there uncomfortable memes? I think the distracted boyfriend, I think if I can mention, but um, I've been part of a couple conversations where people were called out, and this is being um, discussed on the chat as well, people being called out for using it. Um, even though it says so much as we, you can see in the, the um, course video, it, it's just, it's uncomfortable. Ariana, I think you were going to say something. Sorry. I think it was actually Sarah, but I, I could go after. Oh, sorry. That was, was yeah. Um, but I was just going to talk about the one that is used a lot in, um, like, conservative circles, I think, mainly, like, the, the NPC. They're, like, gray people. I don't really know, like, what they're called. But I think, like, definitely that makes me uncomfortable, like, mostly because there's, like, this – like underlying context I don't get and like being with people being in like this circle that I don't necessarily agree with um or like don't under understand really like where it came from or or what they mean by that um that that's one that I've like seen on like weird subreddits um and it definitely goes along with like the MAGA like menemist kind of circles that's that's very strange and i like don't really get it all and i just like try to stay away from them <laughs> from those memes the last thing i was gonna say is i was gonna raise um a comment that came up in the chat which said i'm uncomfortable if i'm not sure of the original content and i feel like that's a rule that maybe we could almost universally apply as sort of something to to try and go by and see how that that works for our meetings mm -hmm. Where do stock photos lie in that? Because some stock photos are really problematic. This is really interesting to me. And actually, it reminds me of the conversation that um, we've had in Mark, Dr. Mark Sample's classes a bunch of times about the Siri model. So, or not the Siri model, like the Siri voice actor. And so, so the Siri voice actor now is like a completely well-known voice. Like if you hear her speaking, you just think Siri is talking to you because that's how much it's just her voice that she's sold off to like Apple for all of their products. And it really reminds me of that question because it's like, at what point is like becoming a stock photo model, like consenting to have your body narrated in whatever way anybody on the internet ever wants? I don't know, but that's really scary to me. And I don't know that people that are taking stock photos know that when they sign up for that. So um, right. I don't know where that falls. <laughs> and, and, and actually the actors who are in the, uh, the distracted boyfriend, you can go to, uh, what's the big stock photo site? stockphotos.com, whatever. You can go there and you can see them. They're, they're in like literally tens of dozens of photographs uh, reenacting different dramatic scenarios. So we could, you could, uh, yeah, it, it can become uh, problematic there. Yeah, and I'm one, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm wondering also, so that was something I was thinking about whenever Leo was sharing the memes from his course and he was showing the ones that students had made, I think in the critical meme, the Digital media the title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, and I was wondering that because I was thinking about the All Lives Matter image and I'm wondering are those 
images, is that an image of students in your class or is that an image people found online? Um, and like what other models exist for doing that? So we talked about obviously the idea of like actually using your own photos and images and how that gets around some of the problems. Um, but I'm also thinking about the model that maybe like, I'm thinking of reductress, how, and they're not necessarily a meme, but the way that they use their, um, their main like featured image with the title, uh, the, the title of it is very meme-like, right? So people oftentimes will screenshot as a meme, just the like very blocky title text with the featured image. Um, and how that's actually a bunch of people who work at Reductress who agree to be featured <laughs> in these images and whether there's some kind of model that would allow for us to acknowledge consent in a more meaningful way. Like, oh, you can use my image for this thing that is clearly not actually what I'm talking about, but I'm acting here. I'm putting on a face that would represent this type of person you're describing. Again, I think the very nature of the genre is about capturing things that were not intended uh, to be made for that, right? I mean, just stripping out of context or grabbing a, a, a particular facial expression or a little bodily movement or a little reaction or a little dance or a little something, right? That then becomes, uh, I don't know, it excites the imagination in a way, speaks to a moment in a way that people want to repurpose and reuse and they find a versatility in it. So I think, you know, if we try to, I, I think in general, uh, in my own practice or in my own thinking about it, I think the the kind of guideline of punching up rather than punching down might might be a good way to proceed if you're if you're kind of trying to again the tone and attitude towards the subject matter uh, are they uh, are they a, a historically marginalized or underrepresented group or gender or or, or you know, or is it someone you who's way up high and you actually want to ridicule? Um, and and again, then that becomes a political act. It becomes an act of protest. It is a, a testing of certain civility rules, right? So so these are. I mean, it, it's a phenomenon, right? Then we need to kind of think about it, and and I don't know keep refining our practice, hopefully, ethically. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, agree. I think that's one of the, the main points of this course is to get people to think, you know, uh, before they press send or share or whatever about these memes. The the punch up, punch down distinction, um, I, I like that. And I, it also makes me think sometimes you can also punch up by leaning down on the some other people as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that you know, that's important to to keep in mind too. I'm going to try and screen share. How do you? How do I screen share? This is I should know this, right? It's on the left. The left. left hand margin. There's a little arrow. The green arrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then so, you have to, and then you yeah. have to say start sharing. Right. The digital studies guy should be able to do this. Yeah. We'll tell you when it's up, but it's not up yet. So I just I went to um, memegen.link, which is uh, online, uh, you know, one of those meme generator sites. And of course, it's not uh, my my computer's hanging up here, <laughs> not responding. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay, because the rest of my computer is not responding. So we'll scratch that idea. But I thought it'd be interesting to go to memegen.link. Maybe someone else could throw this up on the screen, and you can look at examples. To click the examples link, and you'll see they're like the most recently used memes. And I think it's pretty instructive to look at what some of the popular memes are right now, what some of the popular image macros are right now, and if they're coming from popular culture, this kind of shared popular culture that we all have. Like, how many office memes are there? Are they coming from more obscure references? Um, are they? Uh, more problematic references here. I think we have it, right? Yeah, it's up. Yeah, yeah. so if you know, if you all look at that, um, the first nine or twelve or whatever images, do you see any patterns? Do you see any any um, interesting things to point out here? Hmm. Well, I mean. 
notice the, the on the top right corner we have uh, something that kind of points at an image of uh, a low socioeconomic uh, kind of white man by a truck. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one on the left hand corner it's a bad expression but you could almost see read disability onto it or you could almost read you know again uh maybe mental disability i mean i have less problems with the aliens one for instance uh, you know because it's a it's a defining moment in the kind of broadcast performance right so um and Star Wars, I, I mean, things that were actually made for public consumption, I, I feel are, are pretty fair game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have less of a problem sharing that, even though it's a copyright violation, but at least you're not appropriating someone's personal imagery. Right? Fair use, man, fair use. Yes, exactly, exactly. What, what do other th others think about some of these images here? I mean, some of them, you know, you, you'll, you'll recognize some of them might not be as familiar. I think the the Kermit one is very interesting, especially like, I mean, I don't know, like, I think it's used a lot with, like, with people my age, but I also don't know, like, how often, like, we kind of mentioned this earlier, like, but how often have, do people, like, watch the Muppets? Like, not very often, you know, but everyone knows, like, this, Kermit drinking tea meme. And it's just, it is so good. <laughs> so just wanted to add that in there. <laughs> I think that meme falls into the category of the wholesome memes. I mean, I, there's this whole category of wholesome memes that are kind of meant to be uplifting and, and Kermit always does that. That's mostly what people were sharing yesterday in Meme and Greet. I think will probably be categorized as wholesome. Uh -huh. We need we think, need meaner people to join the class. <laughs> I think it's even though like Kermit is a very wholesome one. I think it's used a lot of times in like a very kind of like not necessarily negative, but like almost sassy context. Yeah, like, Starkey. I, yeah, yeah. So like even though he's like a very wholesome kind of character, it's kind of been like twisted into like making fun of somebody else <laughs> mm -hmm. right and i think that the kermit meme the one that we were looking at there are different kermit memes but the one we were looking at is also very clearly like referencing this like african-american vernacular english of spit, like spilling the tea or anything like that and i think it's interesting when we have the conversation around digital blackface and digital minstrelsy how that carries over to the language and the vernacular we're using too right so is that something that we're taking from a context and putting in our own context or is that something that isn't using the body of somebody else again. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm curious where this falls into this conversation, um, especially seeing a lot of people on Twitter talking about like the, the use of these like African-American vernacular English like phrases, right? And like where that falls in like common use and where we don't credit or do credit the use of and the development of different types of um, common language now. You know, it's interesting, like uh, uh, going, building on the idea of blackface, digital blackface, uh, I don't think, we really realize how baked into popular culture blackface is. Us, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse is based on a minstrel figure. If you look at Mickey closely, especially the early images, uh, the Cat in the Hat from Dr. Seuss also based on a minstrel figure. So these are images that we grow up with. They're kind of they're like we're we're it's been normalized. We don't think about their roots in racist stereotypes from the Jim Crow era and and later. And I just wondered, like, I'm just going to throw this out there because because I know we're about to, to leave and I can do this, drop the bomb and we'll avoid the consequences. Is Kermit actually a kind of blackface figure? Uh, when you think about his the, the performance that he does, he plays a banjo memorably, which is associated with uh, rural African American culture. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Are is have we all been using the Kermit meme and using digital blackface and not even knowing it? So I am just going to let you drop mic there and kind of we'll we'll see what happens on the the internets and 
around that conversation. Um, but we are coming up on the hour here, and I'd like to thank everybody who took part in this, both in this live hangout and those of you watching and having a great discussion um, in other spaces as well. And so two things to mention. Uh, remember activity two uh, This today is to describe a meme to an extraterrestrial. We tried to not be ageist. Um, we were thinking about how to say that, describe a meme to who, somebody who might not know what it means. So that's what we came up with. Um, and so we look forward to seeing your posts for that, both in edX, but in the open as well. And tomorrow is Mima Palooza, one hour of making memes. So after all this talking and sharing and everything, let's start making these and you know thinking about these things as we're putting them out there for others to see. And others meaning you know people in the course, but also sharing it widely um, as well. So we hope you join us for that 2.30 to 3.30 and be prepared to make memes. Goodbye, everyone. Great. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thanks for inviting me. Bye. Thanks, thank Thanks, you. Leo. Have a great class.